Well, we've reached, let's get on with it. We've reached or nearing the end of our journey in this uh, book that we've been going through, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And today, uh, Tash and Luke asked me to kind of wrap that up, give it a little bit of a summary. Um, And that's no easy task because, you know, we're here 10 a.m. every week, whether we're going or gathering, and we've been going through this content. um, And there's been a lot in there. We've been, we went, the journey through the wall was a standout week for me. You were here that week. Raise, you know, give Sue a holler. She's not here, but we love what Sue brought. There's been so many amazing things. Um, and now towards the end of the book, the author is talking about creating a rule for life. And if you're anything wired like me, then your first thought is probably, that sounds awful because I don't like rules very much. (laughs) And I particularly don't like people telling me what to do each day with those rules. I'm like, there's enough rules. There's road rules, there's dress codes, there's codes of conduct. I just don't need any more rules. I just want to do what I want to do. But if we're going to get the most out of this, I want to perhaps challenge our perspective or encourage us to look at it from a different point of view. And there is some slides coming up If um, my amazing Archie uh, can find the first one or the second one, that would be fantastic. But this practice, creating a rule for life, actually stems from the early church and a couple of centuries after. Next one. As people began to form communities, they began to start organising their lives and they decided to put some more purposeful structures in there with a view towards growth. And so actually the word rule here is taken from the idea of a trellis. So if we've got any tomato growers among us, yeah, Phil, I heard. Which Phil? We don't know. But if you're ever growing tomatoes or a vine of any kind, you'll quickly realise that once you put those babies in the ground and they start shooting up, you're not going to really have a whole lot of success if you don't have anything to support them. Because as they begin to grow, as they begin to flower, and as the weight of their growth comes, they start to be what? Weighed down. Saggy, I prefer weighed down. (laughs) Whatever you decide. But the point is that the trellis is a supporting structure for the plant to flower, to fruit, to grow in every season. And so... We can think about a rule for life like a trellis for life or a rhythm, something that supports our day in, day out life with an intentional plan to keep God at the centre of everything to do. And essentially the point of it is that we then start to have this inbuilt abiding awareness of him with us, God with us in the rhythms of our daily life. It's about how do I live a life that is whole, that is one, that is integrated. I'm not compartmentalising, you know, this is me physically, this is me emotionally, this is me in community. It's like, no, I go for a walk each day and be in nature with my friends. That might be a rule for life. I, I am out in nature and it's because it supports me in many different ways to connect with God, to grow physically, to uh, be inspired in my creativity and imagination. It's a holistic way to support what is really important in this life. And so that's what today is all about. So I wonder if we could just pray. Dear God, we just thank you so much for this time. I pray, Lord, that you'd just give me the words that you want to say and that, Holy Spirit, you'd open our hearts to receive what it is you want to give us. Gift us, show us, tell us, reveal to us today. We centre our hearts on you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we head to the next little slide. I'm not going to give you all the ins and outs of making a rule for life because that would be a really boring lecture series for me. But what you can do is feel free to go and grab the book, the last chapter. Um, It's entitled, very helpfully, Creating a Rule for Life. (laughs) And also, I can highly recommend, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but Adele Calhoun. Yeah, I always think of those pizzas, the calzones, but it's not that. Anyway, it's a spiritual disciplines handbook, and she also has a beautiful guide 
and about how to consider what what might your rule for life be. But here's some just some little thoughts. When and where do you feel closest to God? And maybe just, you know, I'm going to read these questions out. Just have a think, like what drops into your mind or your heart? What's most important to you? Practically, what suits your life, your daily, your weekly, yearly rhythms? What's going to suit you in that way? Where do you want to change? Or thinking of it this way, where do you feel powerless to change? A rule for life shouldn't be a list of do's and don'ts. Instead, it it honours our limits as gifts and our longings as God-given also. It's a practice that helps us rest in his goodness and grow at the same time. I love that image of the plant. It's completely at rest, but it's also supported to grow. And you can experiment with a rule or a rhythm of life. It doesn't have to be set in stone. You don't have to be like the queen and dedicate your life at 21 years of age, however long or short, to the service of an empire. (laughs) It's not a contract. You are not in a legally binding agreement with God. (laughs) In fact, this practice encourages us to experiment, to see what could work. Try something for a week or four weeks and review. How is that? Is that actually taking me closer? Is it aligning with my values and priorities that I feel God's given me? Does it fit? All those things. We can experiment. We're not in, yeah, like I say, it's not a binding contract, but it's like a little raft that keeps us afloat in in the river of our life, centering us on Jesus as we go. And so what will your rule of life be? And for that matter, as I was writing this, I thought, well, what is my rule of life? I'm not 100% sure because I've never actually done that before. This is a new practice for me. So it's weird that they ask me to do it. But anyway, (laughs) I was thinking, (laughs) I was thinking and preparing and I just couldn't get away from... This one particular time in the life of Jesus when he was asked a question along these lines. And it was a question that the rabbis and the teachers of the day would sit around and debate all the time. It's mentioned twice throughout the four books with the stories of Jesus' life, both in Matthew 22 and here in Mark 12, which is the next slide. And the exchange went a little bit like this. You could bring that next one up for me. Mark 12 verse 28 One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. So this is an ongoing discussion. He pipes in. He says, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And so I think it's key for us to stop here and understand just what this lawyer, teacher, scholar was asking Jesus Because when we read it and can kind of feel like, you know, we're classifying commandments into, you know, really important, you know, semi-important, and I'm on a like it scale, maybe like not important or you can get away with not doing it. Um, (laughs) But aren't they all important? I mean, isn't it all important that we stay away from mixed materials, mixed fibres in our clothes? Like anyone who's really deep into the old letter of the law, like... (laughs) You know, and if they're not, then what's the point of them? And so I think the point here of his question, it's not like a rating system where, you know, some are like, like, you know, we could probably get away with those and some are kind of medium level commandments, but then there's this really important ones. No, I think this is about the heart of the Torah, the Hebrew Bible. And another word for that, you might hear it throughout Scripture, the law or the teaching, all these words we use for this this same thing. But another way of putting it might be through what lens do we look? Through what lens do we look when it comes to unraveling all the mysteries of God, all of the crazy commandments, all the ones that seem very, very strange? What commandment helps us most understand the heart of God? This question that this guy's asking, 
is all about how do we know what God is like and his intentions towards us. You know, thinking about the subject of the day, it's like he's saying, Jesus, what's your rule of life? What do you think? What aligns the most? What is a daily practice for you? I'm totally putting words in his mouth. But you can see the heart of what he's asking. What is the lens through which I view everything else? What helps everything else to make sense? And so here's Jesus' response. We'll go to the next slide from Mark 12, 29. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So in other words, I think I've got the little binoculars up there, yep. When you use these commandments as your lens for everything else, then everything else falls into place. You know, perhaps that's why Eugene Peterson, when he talks about this verse in the, in the message, he writes that these two commandments are like the pegs. Everything else is held in place by them. You know, it reminds me also of when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. It's not like I give you this God and you give me that. It's not a give to get. It's about I make this my foundation and everything else is built on top of that. Everything else rises from that place. It sets things to right. Then this next little exchange back from the teacher. Well said, teacher, the man replied. I love that he felt okay to affirm Jesus. (laughs) I wish I had that level of self-confidence. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbour as yourself is more important. Think of the time that he was talking in when they lived in a time of sacrificing. It was more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. It was like, mic drop. Bye. <laughs> but I feel like when Jesus says that to someone, we need to sit up and take notice. You know, I don't know about this, but I, about you, but I can see this playing out in my mind. There's Jesus, obviously, centre of the picture, centre frame. And then There's this crowd of teachers and somehow the lighting has become really low and it's focused on Jesus and there's people just gathering around. You know, there's a camera panning, capturing everyone, like coming in from outside. There's the the guy and he's like, come on in, this is important. (laughs) Anyway, this one guy, whatever his motivation, because it depends which part you read, plucks up the courage to ask Jesus the question of all questions. And my feeling in this recount by Mark is that the man feels affirmed by Jesus' response. He feels seen. He's like, yes, I found someone who, you know, who epitomises everything that I love about the law, about the teaching. And the penny drops for him. And then when Jesus sees that moment take place, he's like, now you get it. You're so close to the kingdom You're that close that your breath is fogging up the windows of heaven. (laughs) You are that close. It's like you're in Albury and then you're in Wodonga. You are very close to the border. You are right on it. Jesus goes to lengths to affirm you've got it. This is where it's at. I feel like we need to take notice of that. Because it may seem fairly simple and straightforward. Love God, love people. You know, we hear it often, we say it often. But what was behind Jesus' answer and why? Well, what he did, he plucked two verses from opposite ends of the Torah. And if you don't know what that is, that's the first five books of the Bible. 
So not, not like they were packaged up neatly next to each other. He took two and put them together. Why did he pluck these two commands out of the whole scrolls of a Jewish teaching handed down at the time? Especially when there were such significant structures around offerings and sacrifices and how it looked to be God's people in those times. So let's look a little deeper at what Jesus' response meant for them. If we go to this next slide. In his answer about the most important commandment, he opens with this interesting statement that we sometimes forget in our snappy little love God, love people summary. And that is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And it's a loaded statement. It kind of, people still debate and discuss, not debate necessarily, but discuss what that actually means because of the way the Hebrew words are and because of the way they just don't have a word is. <laughs> We've just had to work out where it goes. But he's publicly declaring a statement. We can gather this that there's only one God, yet he claims to be God. And it's a little hint into the nature of God. Jesus actually already been dipped and dunked in rather in, in baptism and the dove came down. He's talking about one God, but he's, he's acting <laughs> in community. He's showing a God that is one, but that a God that is in community. A God that at the center of who he is, is relationship. It's another way of announcing that, you know, God, the, the eternal God, has become flesh. And that the Son of God, the Son of Man we see standing before us, is in a deep, abiding communion with God. God is community. He is intimacy. He is togetherness. That is who he is. Not just what he likes to do, but it's who he is. Literally, three in one. And in his statement here, Jesus is quoting from the Hebrew Bible, the Torah. And the first time that these words appear, these, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. The first time I actually hear those is when Moses is recounting the Ten Commandments for the second time in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And we don't have time to go into it today, but to the Hebrew people, the Ten Commandments weren't simply a list of rules. They were modelled in the way that a marriage covenant might be made in the day. And so we might be thinking rules, but they're thinking relationship. So Jesus reciting these words brings all of that to mind for them. A God who is consenting to us, who invites us to consent to him. And that just means that in him... We have an open invitation to wholeness, to renewed selves. And he holds that space of love open for us. And that was the tone of this prayer, the covenant relationship with God in his divine kindness. Next slide. Not only that, but the answer Jesus gave here isn't just him plucking random commandments out of the Torah. He's actually also reciting the opening line of a prayer called the Shema. Everyone say Shema. I may or may not have told you the right way, but that's how I say it. Shema. The Shema was generally recited in Jewish homes each morning and each night. They were very devoted around this prayer. Parents would recite it to their children as they grew. Jesus would have grown up saying it um, with his family. And no doubt all of those present, because they were good little, good Jewish boys, would have also known it off by heart. To the Hebrew-speaking listeners sitting around Jesus, hanging on his every word, we pan back to that image of Jesus. They would have understand that to shema is to hear, but not just to hear. In their culture, to hear is connected to action. To hear and obey is one thing, not like us. My kids aren't here, except Archie. That doesn't apply to you. But they can hear, not necessarily obey. <laughs> to them, it is one. You take off their dad, yeah. Uh, to them, it's one. To Shema is to live out. 
And as Jesus delivers this all-important question, uh, answer to this all-important question about the greatest commandment, he's not talking about intellectual belief. He's talking about life. He's talking about your everyday life. When they hear those words, they think, wow, this is our rule for life. This is what we do. He gets it. This is our, our everyday, day in, day out, walking around life. A life walked out that embodies love. And in a way, the Shema, 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 is perhaps one of the first examples of this practice, this rule for life, embedded into the rhythms of life where we speak it over one another and speak it over ourselves as they go to, go, went out into the day or came back home. Rituals not for the sake of rituals, but for the sake of reminding ourselves that we are lovable, that we are loved, and that his love flows through us and actually holds us together in community. And so Jesus' response was not with intellectualism or wit or intention to puff himself up. No, he responded to that man's question with words that were familiar, that carried a sense of warmth and of care and of connection, a prayer that was embedded into the fabric of their community. I love that. He didn't come in all high and mighty and pious. He took something near and dear and he said, that is sacred. That there is your lens for everything else. This sense of connection, care and intimacy. There is emotion, there is feeling, but it is fundamentally connected to action. You can't untie the feeling from the action. They just don't exist apart from each other when it comes to their concept. What does that mean for us? We go to the next slide. Well, you can, yep. I would say if we're all living the life we know how the best we can, simply relying on Christ to save us from this world when we die so that we can go to heaven, I would say that it doesn't probably mean all that much. Really, if we're all worried about where we go when we die, if that's the extent of what we're worried about, and if Jesus technically has that sorted, then probably the best thing it could mean for us is that maybe we love some people enough that we grab them off the sinking ship on the way out um, into heaven somewhere. <laughs> That's probably the best it could mean. Or not. Because <laughs> I have a feeling that there's more to the story than that. And we get this idea from Jesus' words in this exchange. We see here that he's not giving us a recipe for how to get to heaven. His greatest commandment was not a recipe for how to get to heaven. So in other words, the thing that Jesus thought was most important was not a recipe for how to get to heaven. I said in other words, but I just said the same thing because I don't know that you can say it that many other ways. Rather, it's about heaven coming to earth. Martin Luther King Jr. said, Without love, there is no reason to know anyone. For love will, in the end, connect us to our neighbours, our children, and our hearts. It's all about love. Jesus' message is not about how to find love, or how to get love, or how to attain love, because that's a given. It's been embedded into the course of human history since the dawn of time. That is implied that we are unconditionally, wholly and completely loved by him without reserve. Just as Anthony said this morning, he does not withhold. He is not a withholding God. So now it's about how we respond as part of that transformative power in the earth. Jesus' message is that it all hangs on love. That's what it's about. Love that compels us to action, to mercy, to loyalty, to friendship, to expressions of beauty, to humility, to care, to compassion. And if you hadn't noticed, none of those things can exist in isolation. They can only exist in community. 
It's still about me, but it's not about me. It's about me with you. It's about us. It's not an individual message. It is a message that only literally makes sense when we are together. Jesus is showing us that how we live, the most important way we can look at it, the lens through which we view it, is about connection and community. And there's no two ways about it. That actually looks way different for us today than it did back then. Because I do not see anyone volunteering to sell all that they own and buy a field that we can all have a commune on. (laughs) Sometimes I'd like to give that a crack, but I don't think it would work very well. (laughs) I'd probably, I'm an introvert. It just wouldn't work. Even if I love you all. But what, so what does that actually look like for us? As a church, as a church that is in a town with people, with other churches, in a region with other churches, in a church that's part of other churches in our state, what does that actually look like? What does it mean for me? What does it mean for you? I think it's fairly clear from what Jesus is saying that it's love that connects us, compels us. It's about together, us together. And so for me, as I finish, what's this mean for me, for you? That next slide for me. I put a sneaky question in there that I didn't actually ask, but I'll just ask it. Are we Christians? if we're not in community. Next slide. (laughs) So what does this mean for me? Receive love. I think that's the first thing, right? Maybe it's about simply receiving God's love to begin with, consenting to the consent he offers us taking time to reflect on who he is. The Lord our God is one. How does that sit? How does it feel to be known and to be loved by this God of unfolding mystery? And this rings a bell. Know yourself that you may know God. You might not remember that session. I did it. It wasn't that great. But the chapter's really good. Perhaps it's in taking time to sit with how God created us, how he has wired us to have a need for unconditional love and acceptance, which he freely gives. Maybe it's about examining and noticing the emotions that crop up for us and letting that point us toward what he might be highlighting for us. You know, recognising our limits as God-given, a gift, It might be in allowing God's compassion to completely cover us and then recognising that we can actually have compassion for ourselves. Remember, love your neighbour as you love your self. Compassion for self and compassion for the other. And next slide. Maybe it means responding in love. Not maybe. I think it definitely does. I just say maybe to soften it. Um, (laughs) As we take time, whether it's in community, whether it's in our groups, whether it's in spaces that we go during the week with other believers, whether it's in sacred solitude or both, to really seek God in everything we do, responding in love, to find ways Rhythms, or even going so far to to go home this week and create a rule for life that strengthens and supports our devotion to him and supports our faithfulness to the community in which he's placed us. And, you know, there are all kinds of roadblocks to community. I get that. I'm not ignoring that it can be hard to live intentionally in community. I am not naturally great at it. I'm the kind of plant who just likes my own kinds of plants around me. And they're hard enough sometimes. They're little seedlings. They take a lot of love. But 
at the end of the day, that's what church is all about, the church. It's about those moments. I had one just before when Jace leans over and he says, can't you control these kids, woman? And I knew that was his way of saying, I've been there and I see you. And I love that we're in a community that we can see each other. That's what you were saying, right, Jace? Yeah. <laughs> I got it. I speak, Jason. Anyway. But that's what we do. You know, we're not here to, like, tell people what to think. We're not going to list off all the things you've got to agree on and we're not going to hold you to a moral code. That's controlling behaviour. And that's not what we're about. But what we are about and what we can offer is community. Life together. Connection points, holding space for one another through the good times and the bad times, just as God does for us. It's the meals together, the game nights, the park lunches, the small talk and the deep talk. It's lamenting together about the things that are unjust in this world and then spurring each other on to good works, pumping up the tyres or putting wind in the sails. It's the coffees, it's the frozen meals when you just had that sort of week. It's standing with each other in silence when we've lost and it's showing up for someone else's wins when you wish they were yours. And dare I say, it's about forgiving each other when we stuff up. And it's about holding tension points with grace when we don't agree with one another on certain points because we're all walking together. And that's the main thing, together. So to answer that question, what does it mean for me or for each one of us? It means I can't do this alone. And that's coming from someone who loves to be alone. It means that my devotion to God should probably look like more than Bible reading and prayer. I'm not saying it shouldn't look like that. I'm just saying it should look like more than that. And more than getting annoyed at others who disagree with my theology. But at the end of the day, I think it's only a question we can ask and answer for ourselves. So to finish, let's just revisit that room where Jesus gave this answer. And it may help to close your eyes and picture it. Maybe just imagine yourself in the crowd. It's just standing around casually. You went out for a loaf of bread and you saw this discussion going on and you thought something seems important. I don't have anywhere to be. There's no such thing as Facebook. So here I am. Close your eyes. And here's how it goes. Jesus, what do you say is the most important commandment? And the room sits, holding its breath, waiting with holy anticipation. And then Jesus speaks. You know it. You know it. You know it really well. Do you remember when you were a child? What did your parents say to you each night? Yes, the Shema. The Shema. <laughs> what do you say with your children over breakfast? The Shema. It's as bold as this and it's as simple as this. Hear, O Israel. We'll bring up that next one. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. God, we pray, help us to love well. In Jesus' name, amen.